true are your promises. You never change, you never fail, oh God. So we raise, so we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. So we raise.
Church, we're going to slow things down this evening. We're going to lift our voices in our hands and sing that song. Hosanna in the highest. Come on, church, let's sing Hosanna.
H2H. before the Lord. We're praying. Uh, the Bahati family, of course, uh, they're sick. Some of them have uh, the flu or some kind of, uh, some kind of something with that they, they're fighting. And so, you know, we're just praying, believing God. Also, we want to pray for a Naomi. This is uh, um, my mother-in-law's friend. Uh, she's in her 30s. She's in intensive care right now. She got an infection that they has just uh, ravaged her. And uh, with some other health issues, she's actually in very critical condition right now. Really needs a miracle. And so I want to pray for Naomi and believe God to touch her and move in her physical body. We're praying and believing God to move and help uh, in our play coming up this weekend. Just believing God for visitors, for God's grace and God's hand uh, upon that. We're praying for uh, those that heard the gospel this morning because there was a few of them here, even backsliders and unsaved, and we want to pray and believe God that God would convict them and deal with them and draw them to his love and his grace. We're praying as well, believing God to move and help us uh, in uh, uh, our uh, mother church as they gear up for conference in Prescott, believing God to help Pastor Greg, Pastor Jesse, the entire staff and the entire church there as they're preparing for that, uh, believing God for good things. We're also praying for other leadership churches, the church in Toronto with the Lavallees there as they're experiencing their first winter. They've been in Georgia for, I don't know, 30-some years. And so 
Uh, I'm sure Canadian winter's a little bit different than you're used to, and so praying that God's grace and hand would be upon them, as well as all that God is doing in the church there, praying for Cape Cod, Pastor Campo, Pastor Grenier as well as uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina, Pastor Suspansky, uh, and Pastor King, and uh, believing God to help them in that uh, ministry. We're also praying for our outreach churches, praying for the Van Epps, uh, believing God to help them in Greece, uh, really uh, to see a breakthrough, praying as well for the Harrises. They need a breakthrough in Brockport, uh, praying for the building uh, that uh, Matt and Sarah Stoll have looked at and that that will work out. Uh, it's a good location. It's actually in East Syracuse. And so uh, some of our Easts in our church, but anyway, and so just praying for that, believing God to help them there and, and uh, really cause favor as we'll work through that in the next couple of days, praying for the meeting in East Rochester for the sale of our building. That'll be on Tuesday night. And just really want to, I want this to be over. <laughs> Pray for me and just let it be over. And so, and so uh, we're believing God for that. Uh, we're praying for our nation, our city, in desperate need of God and uh, His grace. Praying for as well all that God uh, it will help people in the Ukraine and that war and that situation there, praying for God to move and be with our missionaries. The holidays, especially Christmas, can be a time where you think, why did I think this was a good idea? And so you want to pray for them, lift them up, and believe God to help them. How many of you have needs on your heart? Man, you lift them up, speak them out. We're going to believe God for great things. I'm going to ask Yanni to come. And seal us in prayer. Let's go before the Lord Jesus. Father, right now, God, your grace, your hand, your dominion, God. I'm asking you, God, right now, God, for these needs, God. Naomi, God, needs a miracle right now. We're speaking a miracle into her life, into her body right now. Uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm praying for the Bahati family, God. Lord, that your glory, God, would move. Father God, we come before you tonight. God, pr we pray. For the sick in body, the Bahadis and Naomi, God, we're asking for a supernatural miracle right now. God, to be at work, God, we desperately need you, God, this weekend, God, that your anointing would fall upon this play. God, that as we pull the altar, my altar call, my God, that you would touch the hearts of a sinner, oh God, that they would make decisions for you, God, that they would lock in into your church. God, we pray for our new converts, my King, we pray that you would reveal the nature of sin in their lives, help them turn to you in their need, oh God, in Jesus' mighty name, we pray, God, for our pioneer work, so oh God, that you would do miracles in their lives, God, that you would help Pastor Matt get this building, my God, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for the leadership, God, that we can glean from, God. We pray that this night you would speak to our hearts, that you would bring revelation in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank God. Give him praise. Glory to God. Amen. We take a moment, share the victory, greet one another. Praise the Lord Jesus. We want to welcome you out to the Potter's House. It is our Sunday evening service. We had a great morning. This morning we had a baby dedication. And uh, what, what a joy. There wasn't one crier among them. It was very exciting. But uh, amen. It was a wonderful service. And so we want to welcome you out to this service. We're going to have a great time. 
And so just want to let you know a few things that are going on uh, that will be back here Wednesday night, seven o'clock, prayer meeting at six o'clock. Uh, also Sunday is our regular services at 945, uh, 945, 930 is our Sunday school, 1030 is our Sunday morning service, uh, and six o'clock is our Sunday evening service prayer at uh, five. Next week will be serious men at 430 in the conference room there. And so you just make a note of that. This weekend also in uh, Linden, we will, uh, Linden Avenue, East Rochester, we'll be having our Christmas play. And so that means practice Monday and Tuesday, six o'clock. They'll be starting makeup and such. And, uh, and so, and costumes and different uh, uh, things like that. Seven o'clock rehearsal Tuesday as well, seven o'clock rehearsal. And so please make a note of that. And uh, it's going to be a great, great play. And uh, just excited for that. Also, next Sunday, right after the morning service, there'll be song service practice as uh, Christmas is actually falls on a Sunday this year. And so uh, just please make a note of that if you're in songs, uh, involved in the song service ministry. Song service practice right after the service. Go over a couple of songs quickly. And then Christmas Day. And uh, Christmas Day is a Sunday. And so uh, it's always one of those things, family, especially a lot of new babies and such and families and uh, such. So what we're going to do is we're going to show a movie here Sunday evening. It'll be at six o'clock. There won't be song service. I will pull an altar call. If you can get your relatives to come maybe to see a movie, that'd be great because we will present the gospel. It's not going to be just a silly movie. It's going to be a Christian a movie for Christmas, but uh, it's not going to be, if, you, if you're not going to be able to be here, because I'm actually ministering on the faithfulness part of the, uh, the list that we signed uh, this evening, but if you're not going to be here, just let me know that I understand Christmas, I understand the uniqueness of the day, and so please make uh, a note of that, just but please let me know. Bible studies on the 30th, and uh, that's our next Bible study. Look forward to that, as well as New Year's Eve will be here. We've got a great fellowship hall, and uh, so that will start at 8 o'clock, uh, and uh, we're just going to have a great time. And so please just make a note of that, and uh, games, all sorts of things. My wife was on Pinterest, which I used to think was all evil, because I would go away for a couple of weeks as an evangelist, come home, she would look on Pinterest, and then have a great idea for me to do, and so I called it evil. And so, but she's coming up with a few new games and such. And so look forward to that. It's going to be a great time. The Prescott Bible Conference, the 9th through the 13th sign-up list is in the foyer. Also, we have started using the back parking lot here. I prefer it personally. It's better lit and it's uh, closer to, uh, to the doors and such. Uh, and so uh, we are, when we get any serious snow or any serious rain, uh, that parking lot over behind us is so full of potholes. We do plan on repaving it, but we can't do it till spring because of the weather and the way uh, asphalt works and such. And so we can't get to that till the spring. So this winter, we're going to be using this back door and we're not going to be plowing this parking lot. So just please make a note of that, uh, uh, that because of the, it's just once the snow is there, it's going to be dangerous. So we will be using this back parking lot. If you uh, are the first here, you will have to come in this door. We are working on keys. Corey's trying to get the keys system all figured out, but they're so worn. They probably haven't been changed in the 50 years the building has been here. And so some of them work. And so he's trying to get a master key made so that we'll work in all the locks and we can copy that. I think he's up to try number three. And so he's trying to play with the different uh, uh, lifts, or the key, or however it works. But anyway, uh, I don't understand it all, but I don't have to. I just put it in and it works. And that's all I care about. So he's trying to do that. So we'll just put it in and it works. And so we'll have keys soon. But until then, you would have to come in this door here with the code and then just go and unlock that door. If you don't know how to unlock it, just see me and I will show you. It's fairly simple to do. Amen. That is all the announcements we have this evening. We're going to have the ushers come and receive an offering uh, of the evening. I got a great text from uh, 
Pastor Matt Stoll, he, uh, he did a Christmas concert on Friday night, and they had 18 visitors and five saved, and it was very good. They went out Saturday morning on outreach. They had another two people saved, and those two people came this morning, and one of them had a notable miracle when he prayed for them. So praise God for that. Good time to get a building. And so uh, just good things are happening there. And so continue to pray for them. That's part of what we give towards uh, the support. Uh, and if he gets a building, it's going to be more support. And so, uh, you know, but that's the way it is. Having children is expensive. A lot of you having children, you're finding out diapers are not cheap. Right? And they neither, you know, all those things. So are having spiritual babies, baby churches. And so that's a glorious, glorious. Jeremy, would you ask God's blessing upon the gift and giver? We have a vision for this nation. We share a dream for this land. We join with angels in celebration. Our faith we speak revival Where every knee shall bow. First Timothy chapter 3. You're going to hear that next couple of Sunday nights anyway. But First Timothy chapter 3, uh, we, uh, we began a series on a, uh, a statement that we, we have people sign who are going to be in public ministry. And the reason we do that is simply, it, it, they're called, many will call them, ministry standards or fellowship standard. And my personal begging of uh, that statement is that they're really not fellowship. Our fellowship didn't make them up. Pastor Mitchell didn't scheme in an office one day. He embraced biblical standard so that you and I would embrace them because much of the religious world does not. Much of the religious world simply uh, has, has very few standards, if any at all. I mentioned this a couple of services ago, but, uh, you know, a Buddhist temple in central Thailand was left without monks after all of its holy men failed drug tests. They were defrocked according to a local official. Four monks, including an abbot, which would have been like the senior monk in, the, in Buddhism, in a temple in the province of Ban Sam Phan district of Thailand, which is in the cent center of the Thailand, all tested positive for methamphetamines on Monday. This was back uh, in the end of November. And they were simply removed, they were put in drug rehabilitation, and for that. But the Buddhists have some standards, at least some standards. Why would it be crazy to begin to talk about standards and have people be afraid of fellowship standards, standards of ministry? They are simply these. You will be faithful, uh, and at all church events, you'll pay your tithe. You will not own or download movies, visit movie theaters, own a television. If you have the internet, you will have a pornography blocker on your website. You're not watching porn all the time. And that you'll stay in right relationship with the church, your brothers and sisters in the congregation. That is simply a standard of these very basic understandings of what ministry should be. 
because they are Christian behavior. They're not some high in the sky, oh my gosh, this is unattainable. This is simple Christianity. Ministry is service before God. Service before our Lord and Savior. And it is to serve and glorify His name. So in our text, we've been looking at this. And last week, or two weeks ago, we touched on the fact that, you know, Moses had standards for the men he was to find. Acts chapter 6 gives standards. Jesus gives standards. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, based on Matthew 16, uh, leadership in the church, different things. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is our text, it says that this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. Most translations use that word and say an honorable work. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife, exercise self-control, live wisely, and get, have a good reputation. He must enjoy guests in his house and be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, not love money. He must manage his own house well, having his children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own house, how can he take care of the house of God uh, or take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might be proud and, that, and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not disgrace, be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or be dishonest with money. They must uh, commit to the mystery of the faith now revealed and live with a clean conscience. And before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. Let them pass the test. Let them serve as a deacon. In the same way, their wives must be respected must not be slanderous to uh, slander others, must exercise self-control, faithfulness in all they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife. He must manage his children and his household well. Those who do uh, well as deacons shall be re receive a reward with respect of others and will have an increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. This is speaking of two different offices uh, in there, one is a bishop or a leader or simply a pastor of a church. Uh, that is the first one. A deacon comes from the ser term servant. It has to do with a table waiter. It has to do with those who were first chosen in Acts chapter 6. Uh, and that terminology became the kind of the mantra of the first century church. We would simply call this someone who is a disciple or involved in public ministry. And so it, the first thing that we, we laid a foundation for this a couple of weeks ago, the first thing it tells uh, that to Pastor Mitchell and leadership decided is that if you're going to be in public ministry, you're going to have to be faithful to church. And I can't believe how shocking that is to some people. That when it comes to faithfulness and service to God, they take this as an option, not as a responsibility. If you treated your work like you treated your service and your ministry to God, would you still have a job? Now, to most of you, yeah, absolutely, you're very faithful. That's not, but, but this is the question, like, why would this be Controversial, yet it is. And all of these are controversial. All of these create problems with people. I understand that. That's why I'm trying to minister on that. So let's think about, firstly, the thought of faithfulness. In our text, the thought of faithfulness is woven through. There's the faithfulness uh, to 
a household. There's a faithfulness uh, in deacons. Uh, the thought of they must commit to the mystery of God, live with a clear and clean conscience. Uh, they would be uh, appointed, let them serve as literally a test as a deacon. And it says, let their wives uh, also, uh, he must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. So let's think about ministry here, because one of the issues of faithfulness is reliability. Now, if you had a car that started 30% of the time, would you call that reliable? But yet, some people think if I show up once a week, I'm being very faithful. 30%. We could think then, you know what, the thought of someone being in faithful, faithful would be that you could be counted on, and your character would show this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. So look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's ministries. Now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. The word has to do with trust, being trustworthy, to be sure, to be believable, to be true. It would be the thought that can you be counted on without special notice? Paul tells Timothy, preach the word when it's convenient and when it's not. In season, now to. There's the thought of when you are given a task, a ministry, do you do it to the best of your ability? God's not looking for perfection because he already knows he is the only one that is perfect. But he is looking for men and women who will commit to what their task is, what God has put them in charge of, what opportunities have presented themselves, and that they would do that to the best of their abilities. Does your word mean something? Can you be trusted? Do you have to be told constantly to follow through? This is a picture of reliability. Our text, the same way wives must be respected, must not slander, they must exercise self-control and be faithful in all that they do. Faithfulness in their actions, in their ministry. This also has to do with the thought of accountability. Our generation doesn't like accountability. Our generation doesn't like to be rebuked, which I'm actually going to be ministering on in the very near future, maybe like next service, but anyway. Doesn't like it. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Don't tell me, you know, Paul tells Titus to rebuke, I won't get, preach my whole sermon, but Paul tells Titus, rebuke them sharply. Sharply. Look that word up. Challenge in the Greek where I preach on Wednesday. Sharply. Biblical. But accountability in your ministry is not to leave people guessing. Paul writes in Colossians, and he says in the end of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 17, and say to our chippers, be sure to carry out the ministry that the Lord has given you. That you are now accountable to do that. Now, we don't know that all that Archippus was doing. But many Bible scholars believe that he became the pastor of the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church in the book of Revelation is called the church that is lukewarm. They were given over to carnality. They were given over to pleasure. and Not in a blatantly sinful way. But they simply became more servants of themselves than of the Lord. And they said, we are rich and we have need of nothing. But God says, you're poor, you're wretched, you're blind, you're naked. 
And the reason he goes through that to tell them what they had become is they had lost any sense of accountability. You and I and everyone else is going to stand before God, not for what other people were supposed to do, but for what you were supposed to do. That's what you're going to stand before God for. You're not going to be able to stand before God and say, well, I would have been faithful except for X, Y, and Z. It doesn't work. God's going to require what you, you're going to give an account. Proverbs 25, 19, putting faith in an unreliable person in a time of trouble is like chewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot. Trusting someone who, who is not faithful is painful. I don't know if you've ever had a broken tooth, but it only hurts when you do two things, when you breathe in and when you breathe out. If you were to stop breathing, the pain would go away. The same. Right? It hurts. It's very painful. It's absolutely agonizing. When you're too hurt, oh man, I've had, oh, feelings fall out and things like that. And it was just absolutely agonizing. Because that's what's like relying on someone who's unfaithful. Or it foot that is a lame foot this hinders you from going forward with any speed when you're hurt when you're la- when your foot is lame when you're limping and you know you can't go fast it's like you can't run a marathon at this pace and that's the picture that he says it's like relying on an unfaithful person someone who just doesn't show up when they need to be there when they were supposed to be there. You're not going to be in service? Someone should know. And I don't know if you know this, but they invented these neat things. They're called telephones. And not only with a telephone can you call, but you can also text. I don't know if you knew this. It's a really neat invention. If you, ha- if you don't know this, there's a number of companies that are out there right now that will help you to get this. And you could send a text to say, mm, me, and let me know that you're not going to be in your position. That would be very helpful. Again, accountability. People, oh, why do I need to do that? Why do I need to have you in ministry? It's a accountability. This gets better by the end. Don't worry. We're going to get the hard part out of the way. And it's the other thing that faithfulness involves is commitment. This is more than talent. Some people think, well, I have a talent. I can play an instrument. I can sing. I, can, I understand electronics. I understand this. So therefore, I should be in this ministry. But the problem with that is commitment is not just showing up. It's actually learning your part. You know, when we have song, we have a wonderful song service. Because people learn their part. Right? They, it would be very hard if Randy decided to play in G minor and Logan decided to play in, in, in D major. It's going to be painful. If you don't understand music, just think of nails on a chalkboard. That's what it would be like. It would be absolutely horrific if everyone's playing their own time, their own chords, their own measure, their own whatever. It takes coordination. That takes commitment. Learning your ministry. We live in a day when technology moves along, moves along, moves along. I remember my wife, when we got married in the Cape Cod church, she did the overhead. Now, I need to explain this to some young people, but this is how we did songs. You had to write them on what was called a transparency, which is a clear piece of plastic. 
And you put it on this light that would project it through two mirrors on the wall so that you could read, you could read the songs. True story, my wife was given the task of getting this ready for the Bible conference. Our building on Cape Cod when we first got saved wasn't big enough for that. And so Pastor Stevens walked up to her and said, you know what, we need songs. And she said, oh, which ones? He said, all of them, Friday night before the conference started on Monday. So she got a couple of girls together, and they wrote out all the songs that we sang in the church for the overhead. In a couple of, on, that was what they did on Saturday. I mean, pretty much that's what they did the whole day. That's commitment. Second Timothy 2.2, the things you've heard of me and have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who are able to pass them on to others. Faithfulness is observable. It has to be observable. Faithfulness, well, man, I'm faithful in here. Yeah, but where were you Wednesday? You know what I mean? Like, if it's, it's observable. Psalms 33, verse 3, sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. Maybe you're not learning the harp. Maybe you're learning the guitar or the mandolin or a computer system or how the building works on ushers or how to do a Bible study or whatever it would be. The conditions of ministry aren't sometimes or when I feel like it. And again, I'm not, I mentioned Christmas night. I'm, you know, flexible. I get it. But if your car only started 30% of the time, if your refrigerator only worked three days out of the week, you would call it a piece of junk. Then why is that sacrifice of ministry acceptable in your mind to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Why would that? Let's talk secondly of faithfulness and its reward. Because one thing is clear in the Bible, because it has a lot to say about faithfulness. And it's very clear that in faithfulness, there are rewards that you and I get when we embrace responsibility. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 16 about a man who had been unfaithful. He had been cooking the books for his boss. And so when his boss figured out, he's cooking my books, I'm firing him. He pulls some strategies, tries to set himself up for later business. And Jesus makes the statement, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful with large ones. If you are dishonest with little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibility. If you are untrustly about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you have not been faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, he's talking here specifically about money, but he brings out the faithfulness factor. And if you're faithful in the little things, God will open bigger doors. He promises that. He also says the small things, if you're not faithful with the small things, what are the small things in life? The, the unglamorous things, the things that aren't seen. My first ministry was cleaning the church. No one saw that. No one was around for that. Not a lot of people were ever applauding me or thanking me. That was my first ministry. I cleaned toilets. I cleaned and vacuumed the church for almost a year by myself. And then when I started dating just at the end, my wife would help me sometimes. She wasn't my wife then, but she would help me sometimes. And that this began to be something that I didn't get a lot of praise for. Not yay. 
It just kind of evolved. But would it be, could that be linked to how I ended up as a missionary out of that church? Because when you're faithful with the small things, God then rewards you with greater things. This is what Paul is writing to Timothy about the deacons. Let them be tested. God uses ministry now to open doors for you later. He weighs out your faithfulness now in order to reward you with things later. Paul says, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ who gave me the strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy, or some translations say faithful, pointing me to serve. Paul says, you know why I have the ministry of an apostle? Because he counted me faithful in the 14 years I was in the church in Antioch, and I wasn't an apostle. It's very interesting that this may not be simply just a ministry. Maybe you will never have pulpit ministry. That's fine, but God will give you and bless you according to your faithfulness. And this is why it opens doors. Nehemiah 7.2, I gave the responsibility of governing Jerusalem to my brother Hanai, along with Haniaiaha, or whatever his name is, the commander of the force, force, uh, fortress, for he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. That's a powerful statement. Paul says of, si of Silas uh, in uh, 1 Peter 5.12, uh, I've written to you this short letter with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. He's literally sending the letter with Silas and saying Silas is taking over the church. He's going to be the new pastor. And one of the marks, I can tell you about him, he is faithful. Daniel, the mark of Daniel's life in the book of Daniel. Daniel, 4, verse, uh, Daniel 6, verse 4, and other administrations and high officials began searching to find fault in the way of Daniel, the way he was handling government affairs, but they could not find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful always responsible and completely trustworthy. All of these men, God exalted all of these, and we could talk about Ruth, we could talk about women in the Bible as well that were faithful. Clement, uh, Clementine, the, the God, uh, uh, Paul writes in Romans 16, 1 about this woman and says, she is my faithful helper in the gospel. Absolutely goes numbers of ways, but the point being is simple, that God is looking for faithfulness and rewards faithfulness. He blesses faithfulness. God is looking for you to be faithful. There's a couple of areas there that you got to just think about. It means when you're not, when you don't feel like it. I mean, I, it was a joke when I first read it. You know, the guy's laying in bed, and he's like, I don't want to go to that church. There's no love in that church. I never feel anything at the church. I, you know, I don't want to. His wife says, you have to go to church. He's like, I don't want to go to church. He says, you're the pastor. You have to go to church. I get that. Right? I, to me, at first, it was a joke. But after a while, i like, no, that's actually more reality than I'd like to admit. But anyway... It's not if there's nothing else to do. If I don't get a better offer. It also means that you will do what you're supposed to do. Funny, in faithfulness, some people think, oh, well, you know, we don't have, you know, certain people have certain tasks to do. And part of when church problems happen is typically when somebody else decides they should do that task. They should take over. You know what? You know, wouldn't it be weird if, you know, we started service and someone gets up and says, you know what, Nelson, get out of the way. I want to lead songs. I think I can do it better than you do. 
it probably give them, watch them flail and flutter because it ain't as simple as it looks. Nelson does a great job with that. He really does. Really giving himself to it. Really has. Right? That we have people who do certain things. There's reasons why certain people should just do certain things. And that when you're doing one thing, don't try to interfere with someone else in doing what they're saying. I mentioned before Tony Blair's book called The Downing Street Years. Tony Blair was the Prime Minister of England or the United Kingdom from 19, I think it was 1994 to well into the 2000s. And he, was, he was the first prime minister elected for three consecutive terms and resigned somewhere in his third term to give it to his friend, Gordon Brown. But in that very interesting, he made the statement, he said, when before, when labor was out of power for 21 years, under Margaret Thatcher and, and Major, he said it was very easy to criticize, very easy to be the opposite position. All you had to do was criticize whatever the government did. If they did, made a decision, you had to just come out and say that was the wrong thing. He said it was very, very different when you had to actually govern, when you actually had to make policies and, and do that. And so he's talking about how it's very easy. And, you know, Newton's law of uh, you know, one of the laws of therm thermodynamics for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Let me tell you the church law of that. For every action, there's an equal and more powerful criticism from someone else. That's why you should just be faithful with what you need to do. Because the issue of faithfulness is actually a tremendous revealer of the heart. That's what it is. Proverbs 24, 23. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of life. Again, what is ministry? If I asked you what, if you have ministry, if you had public ministry, and I asked you, what do you do? You'd tell me a task. I'm an usher. I'm a, I'm a musician. I, I, work on, I work on the computer. I do this. I, whatever it might be. You would say a task. I'm a singer. I'm a whatever it is. And that's fine. That's that's good. I'm 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 a preacher. But it starts with being faithful to God. Having a heart that is right with God. So that's where we first have to check. Because it's not competition. It was very sad as we were. In Puerto Rico, Pastor Hector was telling me that his church had done an outreach to Cuba, and they had planted, uh, Cuba's opening up very slowly and very, uh, you know, uh, it's starting to uh, come alive, and he, Pastor Hector is actually born in Colombia. He has, holds dual citizenship, so he could go in there on his Colombian passport. It was, it was very sad. He was doing a, uh, uh, they were doing an outreach. And they had set up a concert, and they were doing it. And, you, you know, I was actually surprised at some of the liberties that they had in Cuba and, uh, and to preach and to such. And they said, yeah, the only issue with most communist governments, as long as you're not mentioning anything about politics, you're golden. Just tell people you should live better, be honest. The government doesn't have a lot of argument with that. So they were talking about this. So they did this outreach, they set up to do this, and a pastor showed up from another group, and he said, what are you doing here? He said, we, we evangelize. He says, no, 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 this is my neighborhood. The pastor said, well, you know what, there's a lot of sinners around here. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of, he said, no, no, this is my neighborhood. The next day after the outreach, the government authorities came, showed up, and threw him out of the country. Pastor, our fellowship. Why? Supposedly saying something about the government and, you know, spreading lies or democracy or whatever, uh, you know, that's dangerous there in Cuba. But the truth is, it was jealousy. 
It was a heart issue. And when Pastor Hector told me the story, I said, you know, doesn't that just, can you imagine God in heaven going, yes, he needed to go. Can you imagine that? God in heaven going, yeah, man, that's right. He was outreaching. You believe he was preaching to sinners? He needed to get out of there. Can you picture God in heaven doing that? I think not. Just saying. That's why ministry and faithfulness starts with a heart issue. He mentions in our text both the pastor and the bishop need to, uh, the deacon have to be faithful to their why. Not just showing up three times a week to services and saying, I can do a task, but a lifestyle. And we all know that if you're not faithful to your wife, you have ministry. And I could add here, faithful to your husband. No ministry. It's, that's not, because it's a hard issue. First, third, rather, third John, chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be a leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things that he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, but he also tells others not to help them, and when they do help them, he puts them out of the church. Dear friends, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow what is good. Remember those who prove that they are God's children and those who are evil prone that they will not they, uh, those that are uh, who are evil prone prove rather I'm sorry that they do not know God here's a man leader of the church won't receive the apostle John I don't know about you but if I had a chance to meet one of the 12 original apostles that would be really cool. And I know we will in heaven. But could you imagine if Pastor Greg Mitchell wrote a letter and said, Hey, Keith, I'd like to come and preach in your church. And I went, No. Nope. Nope. Not having him. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? Because then I'd tell you, you know what? You know, Pastor, Pastor Greg, he does, he does crazy that's what this guy is doing to the Apostle John. The hearty. Faithfulness. Faithful people cause churches to grow. Nineteen forty, Clarence Jordan founded a movement in, in Georgia, the nation Georgia. Uh, I'm sorry, the city, uh, the, no, the state of Georgia. As a haven, he founded a city there called Americus for a haven of racial unity. This is in the midst of Jim Crow South, the Ku Klux Klan, segregation, separate restrooms, the whole insanity. In 1954, the Ku Klux Klan burned every building on his farm except for his home. In the midst of the raid, Jordan recognized the voice of a local news reporter wearing a sheet. The next day, the reporter showed up to do a story about the arson while the rubble was still smoldering. He found Jordan in a field planting seeds. And he said, I heard the awful news of the tragedy last night, and I came out to do a story on the closing of your farm. Jordan ignored him and just kept planting and hoeing. The reporter continued to prod with no response. Finally, the reporter said, you've got two PhDs, you've got 14 years into the farm, and now there's nothing left. Just how successful do you think you've been? 
With that statement, Jordan did stop hoeing. He said to the reporter, you just don't get it. You don't understand us Christians. It's not about our success. It's about our faithfulness. That's what God is looking for. Faithfulness. That it's not based on our circumstances. Because it's that that causes the blessing of God on your life. So when I talk about faithfulness, because you can always tell when somebody's not doing well, they start missing church, right? And again, I understand work schedules, and I understand the vacations and, and family gatherings and things like I get that, right? The world doesn't stop because we're having service. I understand that. It used to have, be that way, but it doesn't. Right? There used to be. I lived in a time when the stores were closed on Sunday. Right? Then they opened them for four Sundays a year. It was from Thanksgiving to Christmas. Before too long, it was just another work day. I understand that. I get that. But faithfulness is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. That's what this man proved. Lost everything. But he said, you know what? You don't get it. It's not about measure of where it, about faith. That's what God will bless. That's what God will honor. That's why it's the first statement in our ministry form. It goes just beyond attending church services. The heart issue. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. We've had a wonderful day in the Lord, baby dedication and visitors and people who are here. And it would be not fair to give again the opportunity for those who do not know Jesus Christ in a personal way to respond and give their lives to him. Or maybe you're backslidden and you need Jesus. I wonder if that's you this evening. You want to... Pray. I wonder if you'd slip up your hands. Say, you know what? That's me. I'm not right with God. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. Anyone at all? How do you check your heart issue then towards faithfulness? Well, if I talked about reliability, accountability, commitment, did that upset you? Would you have a job? Would, if you had an employee, ministry is not a job. Not being an employee to a business. Service before the Lord. What God is looking for before anything else, faithful. He rewards it blesses it, opens doors for it. He causes untold, untold rewards for the faithful people. There are two women, one in the Cape Cod Church and one in the Prescott Church. Ellie Lazok, Bev Lazarus. These are faithful women. They will never preach. They're well in their senior years. They can't go on outreach teams. They can't be on impact teams. They can't serve in any kind of capacity in the church. They're not talented with music or anything like that. They're not computer savvy. They're not anything. But one thing they are is faithful. They pray. They encourage. They're in church. They're amazing women who physically are limited now because of their age, but not their heart. And this is what God is looking for in our lives. We're going to stand. We're going to open up these altars. Allow people to find a place to pray. We're going to sing a song. Worship his name. Give him praise. Splendor of our King. The splendor of our King.
Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you are able and wonderful, worthy of Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I, just so you know, I, I did this series back uh, in Lithuania as well. That was one of the things that inspired me. And it was at a time where people were questioning. And I heard someone, uh, man, you know, you know fellowship stand. It's like, and I said, no, in my heart, I said, no, these are biblical. These are not just our fellowship doing that. It's like, this is what the Bible says. And that whether you have public ministry or not, it's still a heart issue. It's not just a task to do. It's God saying, here, I want to give you, I want to bless you. I want to use your life. Some of you could, you say, well, I can't be involved or I can't do this. You could pray. You can pray. You can be involved in the work of the kingdom of God without having a title or a responsibility in the service or in the building. You can be involved in minute. We're all ministers before the Lord. God wants, we'll check our hearts from time to time. And so we're going to, Continue on. We're going to look at all of these. I've condensed three of them down into one. Keep your eyeballs in your head. It will, you'll be understand when you get there. That, you know, as you are, if you, anyway, I won't belabor you with that until we get there. But, but the understanding of these is really just be a Christian. Come down to heart issue. Every single. And ministry will not only check our heart, that's why. Getting our hearts right. Because I'll just share this with you. Uh, Brian sent to me a, a neighborhood. It's an app. A little thing on, on uh, our building. And uh, someone put it up there because they don't, they don't like. They, they just, they're NIMBYs. And NIMBYs are not in my backyard kind of people. And so, you know, uh, they don't want anything to change. They want our church to remain a dog walking park for the condos. And so they put it up, but people were all in, interested in uh, this, and nine, nine out of ten of them were like, this is great, this is what our city needs, da, da, da. But also came up with the old potter's house. Where did the potter's house go? And one woman said, I don't know. I was driving down Clover, and I can't remember if it was the corner of Highland or the corner of some other road, but they're there now. And when I drove by, I saw more cars in the parking lot than they ever had over in East Rochester. I don't know if that's true or not. But I'll go with that. Let's go with that for just a minute. But the point being, we're going to see revival. One of the things that I heard from numbers of different families and visitors was this building is a far light year advance from the old building. And they said, this is a great facility. This is amazing. And I think you know, some of them, that's going to be their final excuse was, hey, it's an ugly building. I would never go there. And, you know, well... <laughs> That excuse is out the window, right? We're going to have revival. What I'm saying is not sure. We're going to see God move, but it's going to take four assembled people that God has chosen. And I look here and I'm saying, this is it. God has brought you here for such a time as this that we can be together for all that God wants to do. But it's going to take that standard in our lives before it can. That's why I'm ministering on because I'm expecting 2023 Mendes revival. Done with the Linden Street building, be able to go on and not vexed with that. <laughs> lawyers, and I'll be glad when I'm done with lawyers, and bankers, and uh, real estate agents, and, and all of that. Put it in town board meetings and all that. I can just move on and we can just survival here. 2022 will be a blur memory of, wow, wow I remember that, kind of. <laughs> right? Good things happen, but man, I didn't sleep much. And so, it's going to happen. That's why I'm ministering. It begins and all of them will come down to heart. So, I won't keep you much longer, but that's why, we're do that's why I'm ministering. Just so you know, understand that. And let's bow our heads. Let's go rejoicing. Aiden, would you close us?
Amen. The Lord bless you.